Hello and welcome to Gospel Foundations, where today we'll be taking a look into the teachings of Jesus. My name is Leslie Carroll, and it's my privilege to facilitate our study as God leads our look into the storyline of Scripture through the reality of who He is. If you'd like to know any more information about this study or any of our studies, you can find information on LifeWay.com. Jesus' fame began to grow. Crowds began to form as people anticipated encountering the one who taught with authority that no one had ever experienced before and who performed such marvelous signs and wonders. But Jesus was never arbitrary in his words or his deeds. Everything he said and did served the greater purpose of revealing himself as God's chosen Messiah, the Savior of the world. Jesus' ministry generated amazing popularity, but it created just as much controversy. One of the reasons was that Jesus associated with people who were considered to be outcasts and therefore off-limits to religious people. Instead of shunning these people as the religious community expected, Jesus welcomed them and even positioned them as positive examples in his teachings. Jesus wanted everyone, from the greatest to the least, to understand that God was on a mission to seek and to save the lost, and he was overjoyed with any sinner who came home. Let me ask, how can unexpected characters in stories serve the purposes of the storyteller? Well, unexpected characters by nature catch us off guard, and they force us to reckon with their purpose. Unexpected characters can challenge our routine patterns of thinking. We most often identify with protagonists in stories, so unexpected characters cause us to rethink our perceptions of people and even our understanding of God's ways. Well, let's set the context for our study by looking at the relationship between words and deeds. Words and deeds are meant to back each other up. Walk the walk and talk the talk. But good deeds can be undermined or seen as selfish actions because of the way that we might talk about them. We should always reject the pattern that says, do as I say and not as I do. Jesus taught with authority backed up by his miracles. But what was the substance of that teaching? While Jesus taught on a variety of subjects, several themes were repeated in his teaching as he traveled throughout Palestine. One unique characteristic of his stories was his use of unexpected heroes. Instead of positioning Jewish religious men at the center of his stories, Jesus often held up Gentiles, women, and even children as having characteristics that should be emulated. Furthermore, Jesus emphasized the role of the heart in his teaching. The religious system of the day was oppressive for the people, and to make matters worse, the religious leaders took advantage of loopholes, and they lived in open hypocrisy. But when Jesus taught, he cut through the external obligations, and he focused on the heart. One more distinct component to Jesus' teaching was his use of parables a common form of teaching in Judaism to communicate rich meaning through memorable symbolism. But Jesus said, however, that he taught in parables not because they were easy to remember, but because teaching in parables actually separated those who were his disciples from those who were not. We find meaning in stories because that is how God made us. But understanding the proper spiritual significance of Jesus' parables apart from faith in him is impossible because true understanding leads to a faith-filled response. It leads to repentance and faith and obedience. Well, let's look at the kingdom significance of some of Jesus' parables. First, the parable of the sower and the soils found in Matthew, Mark, and Luke shows us that the word about the kingdom, the gospel, is fruitful only in a heart that hears and understands the good news. Yet the message must still be shared like the indiscriminate casting of seed on the ground. The parable of the hidden treasure and the priceless pearl in Matthew shows us that the kingdom is of such value that it is worth sacrificing everything we have 
in order to be a part of it. The parable of the wicked tenants in Matthew, Mark, and Luke shows us that the kingdom is comprised of people who produce its fruit and failure to produce fruit for God, exemplified in the rejection of his son, Jesus, is to reject participation in the kingdom of God. The parable of the Good Samaritan in Luke shows us that the kingdom is comprised of those who see themselves as neighbors without boundaries and who show mercy to others. The parables of the lost sheep, coin, and son in Luke shows us that the kingdom is comprised of those who humble themselves before God and rely solely on God's mercy for their salvation. These will be exalted, but those who exalt themselves will be humbled. The Pharisees and the scribes criticized Jesus for his practice of welcoming and dining with sinners. The stories Jesus told in response to their criticism focused on God's joy over sinners coming to repentance and illustrated his mission on earth. The God who seeks and saves the lost is Jesus the Savior, whose search and rescue mission is accomplished at great personal cost to himself. Now let's take a look into scripture at how selfishness leads to rebelling against the Father's goodness. We'll be in the book of Luke, chapter 15, verses 11 through 16, and they read as follows. Jesus continued, There was a man who had two sons. The younger one said to his father, Father, give me my share of the estate. So he divided his property between them. Not long after that, the younger son got together all he had, set off for a distant country, and there squandered his wealth in wild living. After he had spent everything, there was a severe famine in that whole country, and he began to be in need. So he went and hired himself out to a citizen of that country, who sent him to his fields to feed pigs. He longed to fill his stomach with the pods that the pigs were eating, but no one gave him anything. What does this son's request reveal about our sin? Well, I think it shows us that sin is an offense to the character and honor of God. Sin is selfish, self-centered, and self-pleasing. But what does the Father's response reveal about the character of God? God is gracious and patient. The drama of the three parables in Luke chapter 15, the lost sheep, the lost coin, and the lost son, is heightened by what had prompted Jesus to tell them. The religious leaders were complaining that Jesus was welcoming sinners at his table. If he were righteous, he would not do that. Jesus did not offer a defense, but instead, he shared three stories. The first two stories seemed innocent enough. A man loses a sheep, he leaves his flock, he finds it, and he celebrates. A woman loses a coin, sweeps her house, finds it, and celebrates. Jesus' point is that God cares for every lost sinner and that he is seeking them out and celebrates when they are found. But then Jesus begins sharing the third story, a much longer story, and it becomes apparent that Jesus is including some pointed details. This third story begins with a terrible request. In the culture of Jesus' day, it was normal for sons to assume that upon their father's death, they would receive an inheritance from the family's asset and property. But in Jesus' parable, the younger son demanded his portion prematurely before the father's death. Asking for the inheritance early insinuated that the son could not wait for his father to die. He wanted his possessions that his father could give him right now, even at the expense of their relationship. And the father would have been dishonored and disgraced by such a request. But a bigger shock follows. The father gave the younger son what he asked for. Even though he was surely pained by his son's rejection, he responded with love and grace. In fact, he actually gave both his sons their inheritance. Did, the, did you catch the words to them in verse 12? In those days, the older son would be expected to build a bridge between the father and the younger son and avoid public humiliation. But instead of trying to restore the family's relationship, the older son silently took his double portion of the fortune 
There was neither outcry against the younger brother's action nor passionate defense of the father's honor. The older son pocketed his inheritance, stayed home, and stayed quiet. Jesus was painting a picture of two types of lost people. The first is openly rebellious, the in-your-face sin of the younger son. The younger son's request epitomizes the enormity and the consequence of human sin. God, we want what you can give us, but we don't want you. Consider God's gifts, his beautiful creation, the social order he has established, the institutions of family and government. But just as the younger son wanted to profit from his father without continuing the relationship, we often love these blessings without loving God. We savor the creation and snub the creator, I'm so sorry to say. Second is a more subtle type of sinner seen in the older son. He represents someone who appears to be close to God, but is actually far away. He may even be a church member who wants God's blessings but could care less about God's name being honored or about being an agent of reconciliation. He doesn't care about his father or his brother, only about himself and what he can get out of the situation. Jesus' dramatic parable continues with the younger son, converting his newly obtained property into cash. When the disgraceful deed was done, the prodigal son headed off for a far country where he squandered all his wealth in reckless living. The boy wasted his money and his life. So when the famine came, he wound up desperate. Jesus described him as going and hiring himself out to one of the citizens of the country. The original language uses the phrase, glued himself to, or joined himself to someone in that country, a description that reveals the son's despair. Outwardly rebellious sin eventually leads people to squander their lives until they are at the mercy of whatever they have glued themselves to, drugs, alcohol, casinos, sex, music, TV, pornography, relationships, or career. We become addicted to someone or something that we think will provide hope, but instead, the addiction brings enslavement. Now, let's take a further look into Scripture at how sorrow leads to relying on the Father's goodness. We're still in the book of Luke, chapter 15, verses 17 through 24, and they read as follows. When he came to his senses, he said, How many of my father's hired servants have food to spare, and here I am starving to death? I will set out and go back to my father and say to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. Make me like one of your hired servants. So he got up and he went to his father. But while he was still a long way off, his father saw him and was filled with compassion for him. He ran to his son threw his arms around him and kissed him. And the son said to him, Father, I have sinned against heaven and against you. I am no longer worthy to be called your son. But the father said to his servants, Quick, bring the best robe and put it on him. Put a ring on his finger and sandals on his feet. Bring the fattened calf and kill it. Let's have a feast and celebrate for this son of mine was dead. And he's alive again. He was lost and is found. So they began to celebrate. Oh, wow. Where do you see the gospel in his response? Heaven celebrates when even one sinner repents from his sin and turns from his sin. God's gift of salvation takes an enemy of God and creates a son or a daughter of God. God does not keep a record of wrongs with his children, but welcomes them home when they repent and return to him. The son had gone to a far country with great aspirations, but all was soon reduced to nothing. After squandering his inheritance, the son found work for a Gentile. Working for a foreigner was one thing, but feeding pigs was another. For a Jew, the pig was the most despised and unclean animal of them all. Jesus' audience must have bristled at such a terrible picture of this younger son's sin and no doubt agreed with the son's assessment that he was no longer worthy to be a son. But 
It was in the middle of poverty and disgrace that the young man came to his senses. He remembered that his father was a good man who cared for his servants. He couldn't return to his father as a son, but what about returning as a servant? Earlier, this same son had wished his father were dead. He had publicly humiliated the family's name and honor. He had sold off his precious inheritance for cash, and he deserted the village. He had foolishly squandered all the money and then wound up working for a pagan and craving the food of an unclean animal. But through it all, the father never stopped loving his child. He never stopped longing to see their relationship restored. He dreamed of them talking, laughing, and spending time together again. Time and time again, his eagerness to see his son drew him to his front yard to stare into the distance, looking for his son to return. Jesus said that on that day, when the father saw the son at the edge of the village, he pulled up his robes and he ran to him. Now, in Middle Eastern culture, running was considered shameful. An honorable man pulling up his robes and running down the road would be like a father running down Main Street in his pajamas one morning while neighbors watched the spectacle from their porches drinking coffee. It was undignified. A man of stature never pranced around in public. Next, the son spoke, and his planned speech took on new meaning. Stunned by his father's unconditional love, the son began to say his prepared words, acknowledging his sin against God and his father, and rightly conceding he was unworthy to be a son once more. It was a speech he probably rehearsed over and over again, but one he never finished. The son understood his unworthiness to be part of the family and to receive such love. He recognized the weight and the depth of his sin and shame and agony that he had put his father through. But now he was truly repentant. He no longer mentioned his plan to become a hired servant. He realized the problem was never just about money, the inheritance, and all the squandered belongings because, you see, the true issue had always been about the broken relationship, which had now been restored due to the father's outrageous display of love and acceptance. With probably the entire community watching the dramatic events, the father ordered that a robe, shoes, and a signet ring be brought to him. These were signs of acceptance and favor, of welcoming back into the family. The father wanted his son and everyone else around to know that his son and he and his son were reconciled. See, do you see, do you see the heart of God in this? A father standing on his porch, waiting and watching for his lost child. And when he sees him, he runs toward him, taking the shame of the community upon himself. This is the picture of salvation. God the Son running toward humanity with arms outstretched, not only to embrace us, but also to endure the public shame and to take the nails reserved for our punishment. That's our Savior, Jesus Christ. Now, let's take one more look into Scripture at how self-righteousness leads to resenting the Father's goodness. Luke chapter 15, verses 25 through 32, and they read as follows. Meanwhile, the older son was in the field. When he came near the house, he heard music and dancing. So he called to one of the servants and asked him what was going on. Your brother has come, he replied, and your father has killed the fattened calf because he, has, he is back home, he is back safe and sound. The older brother became angry and refused to go in. So his father went out and pleaded with him. But he answered his father, Look, all these years I've been slaving for you and never disobeyed your orders, yet you never gave me even a young goat so I could celebrate with my friends. But when this son of yours, who has squandered your property with prostitutes, comes home, you kill the fattened calf for him. My son, the father said, you are always with me and everything I have is yours. But we had to celebrate and be glad because this brother of yours was dead and is alive again. He was lost and is found. 
What does this interaction with the father reveal about the older, about how the older son sees himself? Well, the older brother sees himself as a slave to the father, working to earn his good favor. The older son sees himself as righteous and worthy because he's better than the younger son. He sees himself as dutiful, dutiful and an obedient son. Mm. But let's look further. The father's embrace and acceptance of his younger son could have completed Jesus' final, uh, third and final story. To be parallel with the other two first stories that he told, it should have ended here. All three stories would have concluded with joyful celebrations. But Jesus had one more point to make in the final story of this triad. The older brother was lurking in the shadows. The older son had not been mentioned since the beginning of the parable. The listeners that day might have thought that Jesus was establishing him as a positive example. The faithful son. The son who stayed with his father. But that was not Jesus' intention, hinted at earlier, when the older son took his share of the inheritance too. Now, when the older son steps back into the story, we find him not celebrating with his father, but criticizing him. In Jesus' culture, any older son would have been expected to join the feast as quickly as possible. Instead, the older son stayed outside, choosing to murmur about the apparent unfairness of his father's actions. The party was unworthy of his attendance. The son knew he was humiliating his dad, but he didn't care. He became just as rebellious as the prodigal had been at the beginning of the story. Because you see, Jesus' parable describes two types of sin. The outward rebellion exposed in the younger son and the inward pride and bitterness concealed in the older son. The gracious father responded to both his children with honor and love. But unlike the younger son, who fell with tears in repentance into his father's arms, the older son simply complained. His boasting about his faithful service revealed more than what was on the surface. He spoke about his father as if he were only a boss to be obeyed, not a father to be loved. And he was convinced he was treated wrongly. Notice also how the older son refused to call the younger son his brother. He said, but when this son of yours came home, if the younger son had to understand repentance as accepting that he was truly his father's son, then the older son had to understand repentance as accepting his younger brother as a true brother. And this is where the Jewish leaders most likely picked up on the point that Jesus was making. The younger son represented the sinners Jesus was eating with. The older son represented them. But we can't miss how Jesus ended this parable either. He had just confronted the religious leaders for their pride and their bitterness. But his message to them in this story was not one of condemnation, but to offer an offer to repent and experience the father's love he wanted his son to come inside so the family would be whole. The father then turned the focus away from possessions, works, and obedience. The father desired relationships and said to his older son, You are always with me. The issue was neither the faithfulness of the older son nor the reckless living of the younger son. Rather, the spotlight shone on the younger brother, not because anything that he had done, but because of the father-son relationship. And that relationship had now been restored. The older son was just as lost as his younger brother, but he did not realize it. Where his younger brother was unrighteous, this son was self-righteous. What self-righteous people tend to do is look at the unrighteous and wonder how they could possibly get right with God. But they look at themselves and they fail to see why they need to get right with God. Jesus ended the parable with a cliffhanger, leaving the audience waiting for the story's resolution. Did the older brother go in and join the family celebration? The answer is left to the listener. 
you're invited to step up onto the stage and act out the parable's final scene. Will you enter the house of God and become a part of God's family? Or will you stay out in the field, appearing close to God while you actually are far from his heart? Will you remain out in the field, focused on your works and actions, without being concerned to have a true relationship with the Father? Oh, I hope not. Won't you come in? Won't you become a part of the reason for celebration? The story's grand finale lies in your hands. Oh, I hope you've enjoyed looking at the teachings of Jesus and have learned some things or been reminded of some things. I know I have, and I'm so glad you joined with me. There will be a contact slide that will come up shortly, and I'd love to hear from you with anything on your mind or on your heart. And I hope that you will join me next time when we, we will be looking at the crucifixion of Jesus. Oh, don't miss it. Let's live for our loving Lord today and be truly a part of his family and give all the glory and honor to him. So until next time, God bless you and keep you.